Hello and welcome to Eco Times Magazine podcast. Today we've got Sean Murphy from seafoodsource.com. Uh, I'm your host, Alexander Strong. Sean, are you on the line? I'm here. Great stuff, great stuff. So Sean is a seafood expert. Um, so he he's a journalist and talks about everything kind of seafood in terms of global. So um, we're going to learn a lot today about seafood and in terms of sustainability, uh, growing your own fish, what fish to look out for, what you should be aware of. Um, so Sean, if you could introduce a bit about yourself and then kind of delve into some subjects you think would be useful for the audience. Sure. I'm the uh, online editor here at SeafoodSource.com, which is a news website for the seafood industry. Uh, probably the easiest way to explain it is uh, if you've ever eaten seafood before, um, the people who brought it to you, whether it's the fishermen or the aquaculture growers or the, 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 the importers, the distributors, the chefs, pretty much all of those guys are watching our site, we hope, <laughs> to, uh, to see what's going on in the industry. And uh, one of the things that we do write a lot about is uh, sustainability and making sure that, well, there is no garden variety kind of dictionary definition of sustainability, but the easiest broad term would be to say that any any kind of fishing or aquaculture, which is, of course, fish farming, that uh, has as little an impact as possible on the environment is probably something we would describe as sustainable. And, of course, that, uh, you know, that that's kind of a loaded broad term. You know, there are a lot of... Uh, specifics as well um we can talk about fishing first if you want um yeah go for it well uh sustainable fishing tends to be defined as as something that first of all doesn't have an impact on the environment so um making sure that uh they're not overfishing a particular stock which does happen you know sometimes fishermen with more modern technology it, it is easy whether they're trying to do it or not to uh, to fish too much uh, out of the sea to the point where the fish can't replenish themselves and nobody wants that because the fish will be out of a job and we'll be out of food. So yeah. that's one thing they worry about. Um, another thing they worry about is what kind of gear they're using because sometimes that can have an inadvertent effect on the environment. Um, we uh, Trawl fishing is one issue uh, where basically it's just a giant net underwater that's suspended by a weight or a boom of some kind. And yeah. low, low trawl fishing, uh, bottom trawl fishing, it, sometimes it's literally dragging on the bottom of the ocean floor. And you know, some environmentalists argue uh, rightfully that, that it can do damage to the seabed. It can do damage to coral reefs if you're not careful. So issues like that. Um, long line fishing is another technique that is used. A lot of times it's used in tuna where they literally will trail a line behind the fishing boat that's you know, a couple miles long with a hook yeah. every so many feet. And... You know, it's it's a very efficient way to fish, but unfortunately, you can pull in sometimes things that you don't want, like sea turtles or sharks or whatnot. And even the fishermen don't want to see that happen. So, you know, trying to determine what's the best gear that's not going to hurt the environment that's a that's a big issue with sustainability. Yeah. So, I just want to touch on that because it, it's it's very dear to my heart in terms of the environment. You know, we 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 want to be on this earth for a long time and. Um, I was in uh, Tasmania last year and um, I came across uh, the, these, these fishermen were telling me about this um, a massive trawler and apparently this trawler is so huge and it's got um, so advanced kind of sonars and radars it can, it can tell, you know, kind of 10, 10 clicks out that's kilometers, um, you know, that there is, you know, a ton of fish or two tons of fish there and what we're doing is they're, like you're saying, like miles long kind of trawling, and then they're basically stealing all the fish. They've done this in Africa, and basically, um, if if they come, if their if their sorry hole is full of fish already, but they come across say salmon or a more expensive fish, they dump, they just dump all all this amazing fish that they've just killed and leave it in the ocean, and they've got like washed up dolphins and all sorts of stuff. It, mm. it's, is something people aren't aware of and, and is, is very upsetting. Well, fortunately, I think that's a very extreme example. You really don't see that happening a lot, thank goodness. But, uh, you know, to your point, there, uh, trawl fishing can be an issue depending on where it's done. Now, to be fair, there are plenty of fishermen out there that are trawl fishing perfectly sustainably. These are guys that aren't doing it too deeply. These are the guys that are doing it in waters where they're supposed to be trawl fishing. There are areas where it's allowed. 
and they're reporting exactly what they catch, and they're they're not catching any more than they're supposed to. You know, so it should be noted that there are plenty of fishermen out there that are doing it right. But to your point, there are some that aren't. And you, you know, you mentioned Africa. Um, off the west coast of Africa, that's an area that's being particularly focused on right now by the EU because uh, much of, a lot of that area is is kind of a no fish zone, so to speak, no fishing zone. But we see fishermen there anyway, and it's actually not just an economic issue, and it's not just about the the fish population, but there's also a social sustainability impact there as well because you have on the western coast of Africa, you've got these fishing villages and there are these artisanal fishermen that are going out in these little boats with nets. They're doing it by hand. Some of them are. And, you know, these people are not doing it to make money. These people are trying to feed themselves. And if you have a large commercial vessel that, like you said, is pulling up all the fish, well, now you're literally taking food out of the mouths of these villages. So um, there are rules about where you can fish. And, you know, the, the illegal fishermen that, that do it are a focus right now. Uh, they call it, the term is IUU fishing, which is illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. That's a big issue. And uh, obviously, authorities are trying to crack down on that wherever they can. It's how how rife is it in the world, um, Sean? Well, it depends on where you're going. I mean, uh, again, off the coast of Africa, it does happen. Um, as far as numbers go, it's it, it it does add up. I mean, they they express it in terms of economics, so it, it can be a multi-billion-dollar-a-year problem, meaning multiple billion dollars worth of fish that are being ass- essentially stolen or, or or fished illegally out of the water. Yeah, exactly. Um, I can't. I don't know this particular name of company, and it's probably not best to name it. I'll probably get sued my, my <laughs> ass off. But um, it was quite an upsetting story, you know, to, to hear it from the locals. So mm-hmm. uh, moving on, um, what like I I saw a documentary on um, it was the dolphins, and mm-hmm. it's about the Japanese kind of killing the dolphins. Mm-hmm. I know this is quite drastic, but I wanted to highlight on it. They were actually feeding. Um, the kind of the, the the population like in the shops and passing uh, the dolphin meat off as as some sort of fish, but it had such high levels of um, I can't remember whether it's it was iron or mercury. Mercury, that's mm. it, and yeah. people were getting extremely ill. Have, have you... That that's a real issue. Yeah, mercury can be a real issue with the wrong species. You know, uh, we should note that. There is a lot of hysteria out there about mercury and seafood. There are a lot of people that think that no seafood is safe to eat because of mercury, and that's just not true. Um, but, uh, yeah, dolphins are an issue. Uh, you really shouldn't be eating dolphin meat for obvious reasons, um, for n- not, not the least of which being the mercury. Uh, what mercury does is it's, it's particularly dangerous to young children or pregnant women because it can really interfere with brain development. Um, the, the, uh, a very uh, well-known case of this was back in the 50s in Japan again. It's referred to as the Minamata case, which is where you had uh, coastal families with children that were coming up with these horrendous uh, developmental disabilities like Down syndrome and, and, and yeah. such. And the reason that was happening was not because they were eating the wrong fish. They were eating the right fish. It's just that there was a factory that was dumping waste into the ocean, which is, so that's a very unusual situation. Um, most of the time, you're not going to have to worry about that. The uh, regional authorities will tell you which fish are safe and which aren't. For example, in the U.S., we have the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which has very strict guidelines, very clear guidelines. They basically say you have to limit your intake for four types of fish, which is tilefish, um, king mackerel, shark, and swordfish. But beyond that, they don't really say don't eat fish. In fact, just the opposite. They're trying to tell you to eat more fish. In fact, right now, the FDA is working on revising its guidelines to to add in some positive comments about the benefits of, of seafood and a healthy diet. Mm-hmm. Uh, because w- w- what has happened is you, know, you have some high-profile cases like the Minamata case, and it frightens people. And there are a lot of people out there, even some well-meaning NGOs get involved in this and say, well, you know, let's just uh, let's just uh, play it safe and not eat anything. Well, you really shouldn't do that because if you're eating tuna fish, for example, I mean, there's a lot of great benefits to eating seafood. Omega-3 fatty acids are critical to to health and well-being. They're great for uh, develop. There's been studies that linked it to increased intelligence, especially among children. So, it's really a good thing to be eating if you're pregnant or if you have young children. Yeah. So, 
what are like I've got a big thing for prawns um, mm-hmm. and shrimp uh, sure. pra- here's a question are prawns and shrimp the same thing I mean this might be a bit naive here no but. no it, it's not naive I wanted the same thing a long time ago essentially yeah they are the same thing it's just a different uh, designation I mean it, I, I think if you really want to get technical about it there's probably some vague species difference or regional difference but you know, certainly to the average person, they 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 they're the same. They taste the same. You you cook them the same. You you fish them the same. You farm them the same. Pretty pretty much the same thing. Okay, cool. So, um, it, are the, so which fish have the most kind of minerals and and nutrients? Because I I know you know people say salmon's very rich in mm-hmm. certain elements, um, and obviously people say oysters yep. and and prawns. Because I, I personally, I. I I can't eat some, and I find it slightly too rich for my my palate. But um, mm. I love all other fish. I'm well, a big fish fan. Well, salmon is very rich, and uh, that's one of the ones that people go to very often. Um, what they will recommend is they call them oily fish, uh, and salmon is a very common one. Um, basically, it's a fatty, oily fish, uh, and that's where that that strong, distinctive flavor is coming from. Um, the issue is that oil is very rich in omega-3 acids. And, you know, this is something we've known for years. I mean, I don't know about you, but growing up in America, I've, I've seen for years people taking, some people like to take cod liver oil or, you know, pills and such, you know, fish oil pills. It's essentially a, a pill form of the same thing. But, you know, you can get it from eating a fish, and it's probably healthier to do it that way anyway. Um, and salmon, yeah, it does have a very strong flavor. I'm with you on that one. It's, um, it's definitely stronger than a lot of the white fish you'll get, like pollock or haddock. Um, what a lot of people will try to do if they if they want to eat more salmon but they don't the flavor is too strong, it, it depends on how you dress it. Um, there are all sorts of different sauces and recipes that you can dress them with. You know, I've I've had it with orange sauce and it's delicious. Um, there are sometimes creme fraiche. It really depends on how you want to do it. Um, there are, are a number of companies out there too. And again, I don't necessarily want to plug any names either, but there are companies out there right now that are selling in grocery stores. I know in the UK and in Europe, and they may be coming to the US soon, where they literally will take these products and put them in a pouch with a sauce, you know, basically ready to cook. And, uh, you know, you can't get any easier than that. And, and a lot of them have a lot of different varieties of flavors so you know anybody right. anybody out there who wants to try salmon and they're worried about the flavor try some of those things out and see see how it tastes or try different recipes i mean you'd be surprised how many ways you can do a fish I would like to thank our sponsor this week, which is EcoTimes Magazine. They cover everything green. The magazine is on the iPad and iPhone. They cover eco travel, amazing eco travel resorts, organic recipes, so, you know, amazing recipes to cook, uh, eco gadgets, what's the latest gadgets in eco, amazing eco transport, so battery powered bikes, hybrid cars, battery powered cars, renewable energy, what's the latest in renewable energy? in terms of all the different innovative ways we can get energy. Eco how to, so for example, how to build your own solar panel or own house or something along those lines. They cover eco architecture, so like eco building. They cover tiny houses, which are amazing small houses on wheels, which you should definitely check out if you haven't seen them. They cover all eco news, so what's been going on in the week and organic food growing techniques. Anything green really, and it's a weekly magazine and it's on the iPad and iPhone and or iTunes. So the link is below, so please enjoy. And now we get back to the show. Thank you very much. What should we be aware of when we when we buy fish? Is there any way of, of checking, you know, to say, you know, this fish has got um, too high mercury levels? Or, mm. or is there any kind of guidelines you can uh, give us, Sean, in terms of helping us um, keep a healthy fish diet? Well, once again, I would turn first to whatever your, your nation's uh, uh, health authority is. Um, you know, again, in the U.S., the, the FDA monitors fish and inspects fish coming into the country. And uh, they, they will often have guidelines. As I said before, the FDA has guidelines on which fish you probably should eat less of. They don't, they don't come out and say, don't eat it, but eat less of it. Um, and then beyond that, as far as mercury levels go, uh, there isn't a lot of... Uh, 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 some some studies out there claim that this fish is bad and this fish is not, but really overall, uh, you, you look to your government authorities. They're the ones that, that monitor this stuff, and, and they have, I think, the last word on it. And if they tell you it's safe to eat, then it's safe to eat. Um, as far as sustainability goes, uh, one thing you can do, uh, and I would say encourage your listeners, ask questions. 
You know, don't be afraid to ask, if you're in a restaurant, don't be afraid to ask your server, hey, where did this fish come from? Is this fish farmed or not? I mean, you know, you don't have to ask a million questions, but just a couple of quick questions is usually enough to get an idea of what you're looking at. And uh, the, more and more these days, uh, fishmongers and, and restaurateurs are hearing questions like that from the public, um, especially in the United States. I know some of the larger chain restaurants are are actually instructing some of their managers, yeah, in case people ask, this is what you tell them, you know, that sort of thing. So that's really right. helpful. Okay. So in terms of, um, so we're very big on, on growing your own food, mm -hmm. um, and there's a, a, an amazing gentleman called Will Allen um, who's got a big, um, big, big advocate of aquaponics mm -hmm. um, in terms of obviously, you know, growing your fish. So you've got mm -hmm. your protein and obviously your uh, vegetables and salad and stuff as well. So well, can you can you um, explain a bit more about aquaponics for, for the audience and and why it's why it's a great, you know, opportunity to, to grow your own food? What we refer to it here is aquaculture, um, we, and I think if we're talking about the same thing, um, yeah. usually we study it on an industrial level, not so much on the individual levels. You can raise your own fish, um, but uh, often uh, people, I know in America, we tend, tend to turn to, to industrial farmers that are producing it on a larger scale. Um, I will say this, uh, farmed seafood really is not going away. There are some people that don't like it, that they're concerned about it. It's the same kind of arguments you hear. When you talk about any kind of industrial farming, whether we're talking about beef or pork or chicken, um, and, and you know some of those arguments are valid, and the industry definitely should be trying to improve all the time. But you know the idea that we're that we don't need farmed salmon, we do, or farmed seafood. Period, we do. I mean, uh, the UN FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, back in 2007, they released a report that said that by 2030 the world's food demands are going to be so high that we were going to have to produce as, as a society an extra something like 30 million metric tons more seafood. And for those who don't understand, uh, the average elephant weighs a metric ton. So that tells you a little something about how much more <laughs> seafood you're going to have to elephants. produce. Yeah, well, hey, you know, and, and, yeah. and uh, you know, there are arguments that say, well, what if the fisheries are better managed, they'd be able to produce more fish. Yeah, yeah, that's true. But, you know, sometimes fish populations are... are uh, and it has nothing to do with fishing. It's just global warming or temperature changes, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, you know, the idea that we're going to be able to use traditional fishing to feed ourselves really is not, I don't think it's realistic anymore. And I've, I've written this before on the site is that right. it's, it's, a, it's a little bit like saying, well, why don't we just stock chickens in the brush instead of farming them? Well, you really can't do that. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's not, yeah. not if you want to feed everybody. So, um, you know, as far as individuals doing it, you can do it. Um, but, you know, I, I guess uh, the caution I would throw out there is uh, just to, to really research it and understand what you're doing with it because there are things that can happen to your, to your fish. Nothing that's going to happen to you per se, but to your fish if you don't do it right. Um, and, and a good example of this, uh, we can talk about salmon. Um, in Chile, there was a disease called infectious salmon anemia, ISA. It doesn't hurt people, but it does kill fish. And this uh, disease really rampaged its way through industrial farms a couple of years ago. They've gotten it under control now, but it took a long time and a lot of work. And right. more recently, we were talking about you were talking about shrimp before. Um, shrimp is is probably one of the the one of the bigger uh, farm raised uh, species out there. Um, Thailand, for example, is the number three exporter of seafood in the world and most of the the shrimp they export is farmed and you know uh, all through southeast asia there was a problem with another disease called uh, early mortality syndrome which again doesn't hurt people but uh, it will kill the, the the shrimp and you know in both of these cases you there are a lot of reasons why that disease came about but uh, some people believe that part of the reason was because you had a lot of small farms that people just threw together and said, you know, we're going to jump in and cash in on, on, on the demand and everything, which is great. But, you know, you can't, it, it's an illustration that you can't cut corners. It's a cautionary tale. Um, whatever you do, do the research, study it, make sure you know what you're doing, because if you don't, you know, what, whatever, whatever effort you're putting into this could be for nothing. So you got to watch out for disease management, things like that, especially if you're raising a lot of fish. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I actually was um, I I went to Disney World and they've got a big um, aquaculture thing mm -hmm. in I think it's Epcot yeah um, and uh, they they was talking about you know if one fish 
you know, gets poorly, but may have to quickly kind of segregate it, otherwise it mm-hmm. kind of spreads. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I can imagine, I can imagine it. So here's a question reference fish in terms of around the world. So is, is there, is some fish um, better due to being in its location? So I don't know, it's like fish in the South Pacific, is it, there's maybe less pollution or do, is, what have you seen on your radar in terms of kind of fish in, in different parts of the world in terms of kind of quality? Uh, I don't know if they, they get into the regionalization saying, you know, that tuna from this part of the world is better from tuna in that part of the world. Mm. I think that, you know, with regard to tuna, for example, in the United States, that's uh, the, the second most popular uh, uh, seafood and has been for about 10 years now. But a lot of that uh, is skipjack or albacore tuna, which comes from the Pacific and the South Pacific Ocean. Um, that's not the only place you can get it. You can get tuna in other parts of the world, but uh, the stocks are so low that it's just not, you know, reasonable to try to fish unmasked. So, you know, I, I think it's more a matter of fish populations per se. I mean, I, I think, you know, there there are, are connoisseurs out there that will tell you that, you know, uh, tuna from this part of the world tastes better than tuna from that part of the world. But, you know, unless you're a really serious, you know, uh, uh, gastronomic uh, 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 person, you're not going to notice the difference per se. Um, mm. It really, it, it's more, I think it's more the availability is really what determines where people are fishing for it. Yeah, 100%. So here's a question. It's kind of a bit out there, but what is, have you read any kind of scientific studies um, reference for link between fish food, which they say is brain food? Because mm-hmm. um, I know myself, I've probably eaten, I've eaten tuna, uh, tons of tuna. And like, it was one of my kind of main staple diets as a student and stuff. So I I would say it's definitely helped my brain, but I was wondering if you've, <laughs> you've, <laughs> if you've read anything or seen any studies on it. Well, you know, some of us, uh, I think my brain needs all the help it can get personally. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, there, there have been multiple studies over the years. Again, we're talking about those omega-3 fatty acids. Those are critical. Um, right. that, that, uh, there have been studies that show that there are benefits to especially brain development, but even for adults. It's just, it's just a really good uh, uh, compound to have in your, in your body. It's healthy for you. Um, again, the really oily fish are the ones that have the most of it. Um, salmon. Uh, you know, fatty fish tend to have oils in them too. So, and any fish like that, um, yeah, white fish have it too. You know, you can get it from pollock, you can get it from, from you know, pretty much, you can get it from almost any fish, but uh, you'll see much more of it from the really oily fish out there because it's just, it's just natural. Um, again, salmon is the one everybody mentions because it's, it's just a, a very popular one. Um, but really, pretty much any fish is good for you. Yeah, it, it is literally brain food, and there are studies to confirm that. Okay, cool. Um, I was just re- just looking up Professor Michael Crawford. Mm-hmm. Um, from a, he he's saying it, it's extremely extremely um, beneficial for a brain, which is uh, which is great. Mm-hmm. So, um, what what other kind of fish stuff do you think would be worthwhile for our audience that we we may haven't kind of touched on um, yet? Well, again, you know, uh, if your audience is concerned about the the ecological safety of seafood, you know, um, uh, again, the first thing they should be doing is asking questions. Uh, another thing they should probably look out for is certification programs. Um, these are a bit controversial. You know, some some uh, uh, industry people uh, don't approve of them or like them or don't like them, but. Um, certification programs make life much easier for the consumer, I think, because they basically are usually nonprofit groups that will go out if you pay them a fee. They'll come to your your fishery. They'll examine all your fishing boats. They'll, they'll watch you fish for you know a period of a couple of months or whatever, and they'll come back and they'll issue a recommendation. And they usually have a certain degree of standards. You know, don't use this kind of gear. Don't fish in this part of the water. You know, don't don't fish this stock because there's not enough of it in the water. That sort of thing. And yeah. as and as long as you're adhering to the standards they set, then they will say that you're certified for the next know, five years or whatever, and then that you get permission to use their label on your product. Um, a couple of common ones: uh, the Marine Stewardship Council is a very common one uh, worldwide. They they study basically just commercial fishing in general. Um, this also the Alaska seafood industry has come up with uh, their own version of it, which they call the. Uh, 
Responsible Fisheries Management Program, which is based on standards set by the FAO. So that's a responsible standard. Um, and then there are people like Friend of the Sea you may have heard of. That's another NGO. And they study uh, fish oil and, and, and fish meal and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, when it comes to aquaculture, they have standards too. There's the Aquaculture Stewardship Council, which has their best aquaculture practices standard, basically studies the, the fish farm to make sure that you're using the right feed, that you're not polluting the environment, that sort of thing. So a lot of times these fish, if, if, if a particular company gets certification, then they have a little label to put on it. And, or sometimes you'll see it in the grocery stores on the circulars or whatnot. Um, you know, trying to understand all of the com- all of the different groups and what they all mean is, is crazy. But, you know, if you look at a label there and you understand that it comes from a third-party NGO, chances are pretty good they've looked it over and decided, yes, this is not having an adverse impact on the environment. Um, so, you know, if you're worried about you know, uh, eating something that's not earth friendly. That's one thing you might want to watch for. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to ask you a, a, probably a trickier question is where do you think the best fish is in the world? Oh boy. That's a really tough one. Uh, for you. What, what do you, um, what do you I, mean okay, by I, best? <laughs> um, okay. So I was in Kenya a few years ago and I, um, ordered some prawns or shrimp and they, they were massive. They were like the size of my hand and they were absolutely amazing. So I'm just I, chucking out there, Sean. I'm, I'm sure a lot of countries, um, would argue over this one. So, but I'm curious well, to hear your thoughts. It depends on the country. I mean, and it depends on the species too. Um, you know, uh, salmon, uh, the the connoisseurs tend to tell you that wild salmon tastes better than farm salmon. So if you're going to go that route, um, Alaska has a lot of uh, uh, it, they 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 pride themselves on having the best wild salmon in the world. Again, I'm not endorsing it. I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I'm just saying that's that's the reputation. Um, you know, uh, uh, shrimp comes from all over the world. Uh, a lot of it is farmed. Uh, again, there's not a drastic difference between the two. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, I've, I've had both, and yeah, there are differences, sure, but, uh, you know, unless you're trying one and then immediately trying the other, you know, you may not necessarily notice the difference. Um, mm. Southeast Asia tended to be a pretty major location for them and, and supplied them. Uh, these days, there is broadening a little bit. Ecuador produces a lot of shrimp these days, uh, sometimes India. Um, Europe, uh, the, you tend to to see a lot of uh, a lot of the small pelagics in the north. You know things like mackerel and herring mm. and things of that nature. You tend to get it from that part of the world. Um, and uh, yeah. and farm salmon, you know, Norway has has was probably out ahead of everybody when that first started. But now you're getting it out of Chile. You're getting it from British Columbia. You're getting it from the United States. Um, right. So. I don't know well, if that, that answers it or not. <laughs> yeah, it's a tricky question. I just I was just thinking caviar. Mm-hmm. So I just wondering what your thoughts on on caviar. I've, I've tried it, and obviously it's, it's salty kind of sea eggs. Yeah. But I'm just wondering, um, just kind of your thoughts and and kind of where uh, I think Russian mm-hmm. b- b- is is the best caviar. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are. Well, it, it's definitely an acquired taste. First of all, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I I've had it. I'm not crazy about it, but but I understand why people like it. And as far as the best caviar in the world, well, you know, if if you're a James Bond fan, you know, it's the Beluga caviar is <laughs> one everybody drinks with with, with 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 preferably a nice uh, bottle of vodka to go with it. But um, yeah. you, you know, what's interesting about Russia is. Um, they export beluga caviar all over the world, but surprisingly, they import a lot of caviar as well. Oh, right. A lot of eggs, a lot of salmon eggs. Um, I know recently the Russian trade ban has kind of put a stop to this. Prior to that, um, one of the mm-hmm. biggest seafood exports to Russia from the United States was salmon roe or salmon eggs, believe it or not. You know, you, you wouldn't think that Russia would want to import uh, uh, fish eggs to Russia, but they do. Um, I, I guess the idea is that the beluga is like the high-end caviar and that if you want to buy it in the grocery store or something like that, you're probably buying some imported stuff from another country, you know, whether it's Europe or the U.S. or someplace. I see. Or someplace else these days <laughs> with the trade ban in place, they're not uh, getting it from there, but, uh, you know, yeah. that, that whole thing. Can, can can that last a long time? Can they kind of cam it up and have it for years or, or is it a certain kind of sell-by date? Well, I, I'm, I think it depends a little bit on how it's processed, but uh, by and large, yeah, I think it does have an expiration date. You have to kind of kind of watch it. Um, I think it depends on the brand, depends on where it comes from and, and the species. But, uh, you know, 
as usual, read the labels. <laughs> Pay attention. <laughs> read the labels. That's right. Um, well, it's been amazing having you on, Sean, and uh, we would love to have you on again. My pleasure. And, um, yeah, I, I can't thank you enough for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much for enjoying our Eco Times magazine podcast. We'd like to tell you all the platforms we're on. So we're on SoundCloud, we're on Stitcher, which is for Android. If you've got an Android phone, you can download a Stitcher, which is a podcast app, and get the Eco Times podcast on there. We're on iTunes, so you can get it on your iPhone and iPad and all your Apple devices. And we're on TuneIn as well. And we're on YouTube. So please subscribe um, to whichever platform works best for you. And thank you very much for listening. We want to say a big thank you very much to Eco Times Magazine for sponsoring the podcast. They are a weekly magazine, cover everything green. So if you're interested in growing your own food, renewable energy, amazing eco resorts, eco gadgets, basically anything green, how to build your own home, tiny houses, eco transport, organic food, anything green really. Um, big thank you to them and uh, please check them out the links be below and it's on the apple newsstand so you'll be able to get it on your ipad and iphone thank you and have a great day